John Abbott's with us, Denise Peterson in Maryland, Pedro Foiling Sailor up early in Sydney, John Lamberts Van Buren in Holland in the Netherlands, Warren Schasser in Brisbane down under, Thierry de Jong in SoCal, welcome to all of you and many more who are already with us. We're live again from Studio B, and we have James and Yanni standing by on the other end of our Skype line, and we'll be right back with you. They're at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club in the model room. Delighted to have them with us as we welcome you to our show number Studio B it is, and it's a hot day here in San Francisco, Julie. It's our, what, our second day or maybe third day, arguably, of summer. Yes, and (laughs) we're lucky to have that. My co-host, Commodore of the Beach Street Yacht Club, my landlady, Julia Vedekent. Some of you will have noticed that we are a little bit, uh, have a different configuration today because in about a, a minute or two, you're going to hear the Jets, the Blue Angels of Fleet Week flying over. It goes on. Well, it went on yesterday in rehearsal, but today, tomorrow, and Sunday, it's a three-day extravaganza. Millions of people come to the Bay to watch the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels flying around, and they fly literally right. We're in the marina, just off a couple blocks off the Bay, and they're right overhead. You'll hear them, so that's how we've gone to different mics. I've got uh, the cans on today. Julie's back to her (laughs) microphone. I wonder if anybody's noticed the one other change here in the studio, Julia. I don't know. See behind me? Oh, yes. I've changed from the Golden Gate Bridge to the America's Cup because the America's Cup is well and truly underway now, less than a year to go. But back to Fleet Week, it's a it's a fabulous celebration, but it's a little bit like being in Valencia, Spain <laughs> for the fireworks in March. It's uh, it's just too much. I, I think next year I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move away, Julie, but it is visually spectacular. It is. Are you going over the yacht club to watch? No, I guess I can see it just as well from here. Well, here is a bit of a video showing what a festive occasion it is. You may have seen the dates as the 5th through the 7th. That was last year's video, obviously. It's today, the 6th through Sunday, the 8th Fleet Week. And if you are a member of St. Francis or have somebody like Julia, (laughs) who's a member, the VIP viewing area, Mm -hmm. in fact, as we speak, is going on over there on the race deck at St. Francis. It's a fabulous occasion. And uh, both clubs, Golden Gate Yacht Club, St. Francis Yacht Club. And you saw in that video all the yachts, all the boats that are out on the bay. They have a ditch zone down the middle of the bay that the Coast Guard sets up buoys so that if something happens, God forbid, not only to the Blue Angels, but to one of the other, there's several acts. The Canadian snowbirds are here. You saw the Oracle biplane. But if somebody gets in the (laughs) 
Red Bull. Are they here this year? I think so. Wow. But if somebody uh, has to ditch, they can go down in the middle of the bay and they keep the boats to either side. But it is a madness, and you'll soon hear it, I'm sure, even though we've gone to our dynamic mics and tried to uh, try to limit the external noise coming into the studio today. Do you know, speaking of today, Julia, what day it is? I the would, 6th of October. I would never have known if I hadn't seen it. Yeah, we talked in the pre-check here with James and Yanni, and today is, I've never heard of orange wine. Have you? No. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to surprise them. They don't know I'm coming this early, but I'm not going to go to Bermuda because we got Yanni Berenson sitting next to James Pleasant. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Morning, your, afternoon, even. Your mics are up. I'm. You've got the orange shirt on, Yanni, of your team. Have you ever heard of this orange wine? Yeah, well, that was the reason we chose that color. We <laughs> wanted to <be> perfect. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I'd never heard of it, and I it is today is Orange Wine Day in the USA and beyond. Several other countries apparently celebrate this crude. <laughs> <laughs> this purpose of this holiday is to celebrate orange wine. I thought it had something to do with Donald Trump, Julia. Mm. A wine that surprisingly doesn't have any oranges in it at all. This type of wine is actually a type of white wine that's made with grape skins and seeds left in contact with the juice. I don't know if these are interesting facts or not, but whoever's promoting this holiday they, they thinks, find, taste it. thinks it's interesting. Orange wine originated in the Caucasus, region and what is, of course, now modern day Georgia in Europe, in East East Europe. Uh, orange wine was invented at least 6,000 years ago. Orange wine is best served around, <laughs> bloody hell, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Orange wines have the flavors of stone, fruit, and tea flavors. Julia, just what I don't need. Well, I, I, I doubt you're drinking orange wine in Bermuda at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club, guys. Well, I don't know about orange wine, but the rum looks pretty Golden or orange, or that's as close as we'll get. Dark and Stormies at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club. There may have been a few of those in the in the last uh, uh, yes, forty eight hours. There hasn't been much sailing for reasons we'll go into. (laughs) Well, we'll talk about that in a sec. But that is what is being celebrated today on uh, what we sometimes call a drinking show with a sailing (laughs) habit, because everybody on here likes to talk about their favorite alcohol. Delighted to have James Pleasance with us. He's been on the show any number of times, maybe as many as 10 or 12 times over the years. He is, of course, the esteemed executive director of the World Match Racing Tour, lives in London, and he is live from Bermuda with the leader of the event going on there, the Bermuda Gold Cup, Yanni Berenson. Welcome formally, gents. Thank you. Hi. We'll get to, to it in a sec. We got a lot of comments here. Julie Aaron's in Cleveland is saying it's turned to autumn there in Cleveland. They're talking about everything under the proverbial sun there. Andrew Pindar. Hi, Andrew. I still hear your sea waves crashing while I watch the cannons flashing. I clean my gun. Okay. Uh, Steve Gruber, why are there peaches all over the place? I don't know about that. Ted Ryman down in Cape Town and Jonathan Frank, who's a flying around someplace. What other comments, Julia? Patrick Dyer, Fritz Mueller in Miami. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jonathan Frank saying they don't fly 747s anymore. It's triple sevens. Denise Peterson saying it's the sound of freedom. That is the Jets. Mm-hmm. Stingray likes that picture behind me because he, he's been jonesing for that DeWitt painting. That's an original that uh, Jim, the late, great uh, Jim DeWitt, the famously good artist and sailor and sailmaker, painted. Historian. <laughs> and historian that painted for the Golden Gate Yacht Club, which right. they then passed to me. Uh, I want that Dogzilla monster Jim DeWitt painting. <laughs> Sorry. Peter Taylor's on in New York City. Steve Gruber saying Fleet Week is awesome. Ed Worley down in SoCal. Hello, everyone. Jonathan Frank is home in Galveston. Joe Holtzman up in cold. Estes, Colorado. Graham Sweeney in Yell, Scotland. Good evening, Tom and Julia and all the foes. E. Gordon Smith in Denmark and on. Chris Mueller says it's um, Noodle Day. It's what? Noodle Day. Noodle Day. What's that mean? Don't. I hope that's not uh, sexual. <laughs> huh? Why would it be? Well, who knows? You know what? Look at the guys. They can't even keep a straight face. A noodle, Julie. It's you know such, what a, a noodle is. is. <laughs> you can shake your finger at whoever. Who's who's? <laughs> okay, let's get serious here. We have a serious guest. Couple serious guests, and there's a. Uh, 
Let's go to James because uh, James and Yanni there on the uh, set at the Royal, in the model room at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club. Give us a look around there, James, because you have a live studio audience with you. Some other esteemed guests. Oh, yeah, this is uh, actually its technical name. I've just been told is the Trophy Lounge here at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club. Uh, it's a very nice room, and uh, in in our studio today we have uh, one the team with the biggest fan group, and I'm going to go slowly here, which is Harry Price is in the Down Under Racing team. Uh, you've got here Pricey and Christian, who can wave, and then sailing with sailing with Harry and the team this week is Julia Lines, who is here from Bermuda, who sailed in the regatta with Anna Othling in 2020 and um, is with Harry's team this week. And uh, her parents here, Bruce and Sherry, Sherry, have I got that right? Yeah. Sherry Lines, um, who have been, uh, who are out watching the event this week. And uh, Bruce and his beautiful boat have been out uh, helping us with the spectator fleet as well. So full crowd. Let's do a quick introduction to this event. It's been going on for a long, long time. The so-called King Edward the Seventh Gold Cup, the oldest match racing trophy, as we told you on Tuesday's show, in the world for competition involving one design yachts. Obviously, America's Cup, the Swanica Cup, a little bit older than this trophy, which dates from the early part of the last century. It is high, a highly prestigious trophy with a rich tradition. It was only the only King's Cup ever to be offered for competition in the U.S., which could be won outright, originally given, given by King Edward VII on the 300th anniversary of the first British settlement. Remember that, Julia? Yes. What was it? In Jamestown. Jamestown, exactly. Mm -hmm. Jamestown, which is in? Virginia. Virginia, well done. Uh, so the event, uh, it's kind of a Venice Interruptus, Cristiano like that, as... Um, James will tell you, and James Pleasance will tell you in a moment. The Bermuda Gold Cup, this is the headline from a, a day or so ago, Gold Cup through the quarterfinals with the tropical storm. The T.S. Felipe has interrupted proceedings there with our guest Yanni Berenson into the semis along with uh, Taylor Canfield, Harry Price, and Ian Williams. They've all advanced to the semis, as they will tell you in a moment. And the tropical storm has stopped racing, uh, the race officer got a lot of racing in prior to yesterday, and they are not, they did not race yesterday nor today. And what are you going to do tomorrow, James? Well, um, we're going to have to see what happens with this storm. We um, sadly were forced to cancel the racing yesterday and today uh, for a couple of reasons. One is there was a, a storm watch, weather watch. In fact, all the schools here are, are closed today. And the IODs, which, uh, as beautiful as they are, are, are very old um, and well looked after private owners boats. And they needed to be uh, taken away from the marina and put on storm moorings, which which is a process that takes a bit of time. So the decision was made to do that yesterday. So sadly, sailing was cancelled yesterday. The winds did pick up yesterday, not to the level at which I think some of us were, were expecting um because there's a wind limit with these boats and we're still really waiting for the for whatever storm this this storm philippe to come through and we're told that sort of within the next few hours that there are likely to be pretty high winds here and with any luck the storm will pass if you look at any of the I don't know, headlines that are out at the moment you'll see that it's passing with any luck it'll pass by the morning and then we can get the semis and finals and the event wrapped up tomorrow that's the that's the plan. But uh, for now, we've had, yeah, first time in my history working with the tour, two days of cancel racing, which is uh, obviously a shame for those that have come from, you know, as far as New Zealand, Australia, uh, particularly those in the room here. So it's uh, but it's one of those things we can, as you know, we can c control a lot of things in the sailing world, but not the weather. So tomorrow, what's the forecast? Uh, is it going to be breezy breeze on? Well, it depends. It depends if you, um, you know, watch, watch, uh, you know, follow the news, watch the internet, or talk to the local fishermen, um, or uh, the locals here. You'll get, you'll get all sorts of different answers. But there is, um, there are indications that it's that the winds may stay strong tomorrow. Uh, we're hoping that they will uh, die off enough for us to get out, um, you know, under under 25 knots of breeze, which is. Uh, in fact, I think our limit is 22 knots sustained. So um, it'll be a little touch and go, but we're hoping, you know, fingers crossed. We're, we're pressing on 
with intention to finish the regatta tomorrow. So if it's 21 gusting, tell me what, 28, you're able to race in that condition? Uh, in theory, yes. Um, I'll be careful what I say because um, I'm sure there are various insurance clauses attached to it. But yeah, in theory, yes. I think 20, 22 knots sustained, however you want to read into that, is, um, is, is the limit set for the, for the boats in the regatta this week. Yanni, if it's that breezy tomorrow, does that favor you or do you think it favors one of the other three semifinalists? Oh, that's uh, always really uh, very hard to tell. I mean, uh, we're we're ready to take uh, take on whatever comes up, and uh, I think the other teams would be the same. And uh, these guys are doing well in both light conditions and strong wind conditions. So I, I'm, I, it's it's hard to tell about that. But we're for sure going to do a, a really good job in the strong winds if it comes. I hear you like the upper range. Yeah, yeah, we're, I think I think in the, the middle range, a lot of teams are really good at uh, doing, and it's uh, with these boats, it's harder, I think, in the strong winds and in the and in the light conditions, and uh, and we we like both these conditions, so we takes whatever comes, but um, you still you still need to be on, on top of your game to win this regatta, and it's it's up to your day form and um, and how the other one performs. So yeah, we're gonna take whatever comes. That sounds like PR school 101, Yanni. <laughs> I'm going to go out and wax them. If it's breeze on tomorrow, we're going to beat the living daylights out of them. That's what I want to hear from Sam. No, I'm teasing you. Yanni's a, he's obviously he's Swedish, and he's you're, what, undefeated so far? You had a, a, a point or two nick from you in, in an uh, incident with the, <laughs> with the jury, but uh, otherwise, have you been undefeated? Yeah, yeah, we 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 got a clear round robin. Uh, we had seven uh, seven zero, and uh, then we had uh, actually you go to three points in the quarters, but uh, we managed to have a collision and I get a little point deduction. So we needed to have four races to win the quarters. But uh, yeah, we did them straight. So James, assuming you can race tomorrow, you have semis and finals. Is it first to win two in in each of those series? Now that things are a bit compressed, or what will you do schedule wise? I suspect, uh, given the conditions, we may need to look at rescheduling, whether it's it's first to two or three, and that'll be a decision made in, in the morning. But, you know, I think the, the hope at the moment is we can get any sailing in at all. And then, but as as is sometimes the case when you've, when you've got to do it all in, all in a day. I mean, it's not uncommon to have semifinals and finals in a day. Mm. Um, so we may need to adjust or the, or rather the race committee may need to adjust um and a lot of that call is being made for tomorrow morning because the weather's you know it's it's can be very fickle here um i mean you can you can read all the forecasts but you know a storm that passes 20 miles or 50 miles you know either side of the island can 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 make a big difference so indeed i think everyone's just hoping it'll 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 pass and and, and i guess the a question that's already being asked in the in the questions and you probably don't want to answer this in in so few words but what happens if you can't race tomorrow does the series like golf go to monday or do you go back on uh, who beat who in the quarters and semis whatever um there, there'll be a who beat who will have we'll have a result of the regatta tomorrow um, because everyone's booked on flights to to other events or or flights home so we won't we won't be extending the event so there, there will be a result tomorrow it uh, so, seems to me like Yanni may be sitting pretty if that were to happen. He may be rooting for cheering, not rooting. We we don't use that expression, <laughs> at least with Aussies and Kiwis and Brits. Yeah, no. sure. might yeah. might be cheering, cheering for a lot of breeze tomorrow. <laughs> well, we would for having some good races, and I think yeah, it's 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 a good feeling if if we win uh, or whoever wins the final to just go do that racing and feel that you are on top of the game in the end of the, the regatta. So, so we hope that it's going to be good racing tomorrow. And if not, of course, we are in a good position for, for winning the regatta. Mm. So Russ is good, uh, whatever happens. Uh, yeah, Actually, you've won this before, right? Yeah, we won it 2008 and 2014. So it's been a while. So we're really keen on doing it again. And I have in my crew, I have two crew members who haven't um, uh, won the regatta before. So Patrick Sturesson and Herman Andersson uh, are or uh, you say um, Bermuda Gold Cup virgins, so they will. Um, uh, hopefully, we can see if we can get a good, good, good score for them. Well, Your Lundgren has been with me two times and won the regatta before, so, so it's so. about time. I mean, it seems like you win it every six years. So 08, 014 should have won it last year. Maybe uh, you won it this year instead. So we'll keep a yeah. close. 
<laughs> yeah, I see the pattern also. So I think it's uh, <laughs> a lot of comments here. And then we're going to jump ahead and show some more slides and talk about some of the other competitors here. Some fuzzy Clark Chapin says that this is James's sixth appearance, Clark Chapin in Michigan, who is our statistician and he keeps track of that stuff for us. Thanks, Clark. The previous time was last February. Were you down in maybe in Oz for that, James? Were you in Oz for we were in, uh, in we Sydney? Were in last year. Also with the prices in the studio, I might add. They seem to be, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> with, for, the, uh, for the tour finals last year. Well, they've been on the show, what, Julia? Oh, gosh. Many Three times. or four times. In fact, we've had the whole damn, the whole fam damnly on. We had Harry and Olivia on, and I think they were in Sweden, in fact, in your home country, Yanni. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. When the prices were on, uh, been, Gordon Smith in Denmark is saying it was a pleasure to meet James in Copenhagen. Little Agnes still wants to share an ice cream with him. What's that mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I hadn't met Gordon. We had the final of the women's world match race, the second season of the women's world match racing tour in Copenhagen last weekend. And that's uh, Gordon's hometown. And he uh, he uh, came along and, and was watching the event with his daughter, um, who was uh, trying to get me to have some funny ice cream and uh yeah I forget, I forget what the it was it was a little weird <laughs> anyway uh so i had the opportunity to meet him which was great pindar andrew who i think i think is in portugal uh, he says the schools are closed there in bermuda as you reported but uh more pertinently are the pubs open uh yeah, they are and um as uh, as you'll know when you give sailors two days off sailing you can <laughs> That Nowhere was, to find them. <laughs> that it was not an early night the night before last, and then the club very kindly put on a, a, some music, and the and the bar was certainly full last night as well. So they knew where their priorities were in the last 48 hours. And you can always spot someone who's won the event twice, including the guy sitting next to me, because when he goes up to the bar, not only do they know him by his first name, but he knows his bar account number off by heart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 you don't want an account number that's too easy to remember because other people will overhear it at the bar. I know that's my problem at St. Francis, Julia. Yeah. Uh, did you see Clark Chapin's yes. comment? He's saying that windy.com is not optimistic about your chances tomorrow. But uh, we'll, hopefully that will settle down and you'll get some racing in. Andrew McIrvin is on. Hello, Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin. The Maxis have wrapped up in, in Laval, the Saint-Tropez today, and we're going to have a report on that from yesterday, not today, but at, from yesterday at the end of the show. If you're just joining us, delighted to have James Pleasance, the executive director, the esteemed executive director of the World Match Racing Tour on live via Skype from the Royal, the, the Trophy Lounge. It's not the model room. It's the Trophy Lounge at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club in Hamilton, Bermuda, along with Yanni Berenson, who's leading the Bermuda Gold Cup. He is leading it on uh, the strength of going through it. Gosh, this is this is happening a lot lately. Didn't we see that happen at Congressional Cup? Yeah. Went, uh, who was it went undefeated this year? Chris Never Poole. happened, right? Chris Poole went 24-0 uh, uh, undefeated in the Congressional Cup this year and was... Uh, and then went on to win the uh, U.S. Open match racing champs a few weeks ago, has not had a, as, as good a week or what we've had of it this week, sadly. Um, and Jeffrey Peterson had a great go at Gov Cup. I can't remember now if he went undefeated through this year's Gov Cup. He's won it now twice, but he nearly was undefeated, if not completely undefeated. By the way, gents, a trivia question. Do you know that the Congressional Cup, we figured out later on, that it's not the first time that somebody went undefeated in Congressional Cup. It's the first time in the modern era, if you will, since there were something other than just one round robin. Remember, Con, Con Cup used to be just one round robin and whoever was ahead, and then they broke ties on who beat who. Do you know that somebody else went undefeated back in the round robin day? 1970 no. America's Cup winner, uh, Bill, Bill Ficker. Oh, yeah. Went undefe uh, he went undefeated. So, But it uh, seems like there's some streaky sailing going on here. We'll see if Yanni can continue his streak going forward as we look at some of the competitors in this event that he's already and others have already eliminated. We, we went through this on Tuesday, but it's such a fine lineup. Let's go through it again. Harry, of course. Yepa Borsch from Denmark. Dave Hood from the U.S. Eric Monin from France. Taylor Canfield from the U.S., Jeffrey Peterson from the U.S., Yanni, with whom we're talking, Berenson, 
from Sweden and Peter Holtz from the U.S. Pauline Courtois from France, Anna Osling from Sweden, Ian Williams from the U.K., Nick E.J., Nick Egnott Johnson from New Zealand, Celia Willison, who has had a good regatta here in uh, there in Bermuda, Chris Poole uh, has been eliminated, Joshua Greenslade from Bermuda, and then Gavin Brady, who filled in uh, toward the end of your list. But uh, James, quite a list. And why do you have at that regatta, not the usual eight or 10 or 12 skippers, but fully 16 different teams? Um, well, there's a couple of, I mean, it's an iconic event, Tom, and it's, um, as Johnny would probably vouch, it's, you know, it's the one event that um, I'd, I'd go so far as to say nearly every match racer wants to win. Um, if you've only got to look at the history of, you know, the, the, the likes of Russell Coots and, and the Gilmores and Chris Dixons, and it's a, it's a pretty impressive list. Uh, and this is the 71st edition of the event, so there's a there's a huge amount of legacy and history. You know, it's the event that everyone wants to win. They've obviously got they've got 10 boats here that are kindly donated by private owners, and so with 10 boats you can run a and and usually some fairly stable conditions. Although we're at a time of year which which you know is 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 open to the hurricane, so you know it allows they've they've done it here before, and and we can usually get through a good amount of racing. So they're able to cater for 16 teams um the excuse me so you have what you have two divisions of eight in effect two two, flights of eight that boats yeah we got enough but so we do two groups of eight and then the top four from each as we stand now top four from each group uh goes through to the quarters and then semis and finals prior to the uh to the tropical um, storm warning we would have had a repechage uh, as well so the top three would have gone through from each group and then a second chance repechage, um, which we cut short because of the weather. So the top four from each group have gone, uh, you went through to the quarters and then they raced uh, on Wednesday down, down to the semis where we are now. But it's, uh, you know, it's a huge, well, Johnny can, can answer, but a hugely popular event. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a fun place to be and that <laughs> Dark and Stormies are here and the event sponsored by Gosling's Rum, which I'm sure... A lot of people watching will know uh, who hosted a, a, a great opening reception for the event this week. So um, is that right, Johnny? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And I also, I also think that the club does a great job to open up for more teams than uh, usually, because then you can have some, you know, newcomers, younger teams or mix up with so we have both mixed team and, uh, and the men team, which is good. So I think... Uh, it's bigger opportunities for good sailors coming to match racing. And this is, this is one of the events that give that opportunity. Does the club house a lot of teams that like, like Long Beach does, or are you and the Hamilton princess, Yanni, parting up there on the top floor? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's a mix. Some uh, stays at hotels, but most are staying at, uh, at houses. And uh, so that's a really good, uh, also very good with the event because you get a lot of friends here and, uh, uh, I think um, uh, the, the, it's a very open club and everybody's cheering for everyone. And mm-hmm. I think uh, as a sailor, it's great to come here. And they're also hosting an optimist event uh, at the same time. So we have uh, dinghy sailors coming here from all over the world that mm-hmm. can also see what is in the future for them uh, going into match racing if they want to go that pathway. Otherwise, they uh, having a re- really great regatta, and this, this is the top sailors from each country that comes here. So it's a really high level on the opti sailors. Yeah, I think also. they've got like 40, 40 something uh, opti sailors this week. I think the fifteen or sixteen overseas sailors, and um, it's the the Renaissance Reinsurance Junior Gold Cup, and so all the kids are hanging out here this week as well. Fantastic. Uh, yes. I, ironically, they were actually out sailing yesterday, but uh, which was um, which was a funny <laughs> funny story, but but it. Uh, it's a bit easier to bring bring Optis back to the club than putting 10 IODs on storm mooring. So uh, there's more to it than that. But uh, no, it's fun having all the kids here and uh, they've been meeting their, um, you know, their, their, you know, they're tomorrow's champions. So well, let's catch up on where we are in the regatta. This is your press release from a couple of days ago and uh, saying in a thrilling match that saw a tiresome combined 24 tacks in the span of about two and a half minutes. Harry Price's Australian down under racing team defeated Eric Monin's Kopfi Swiss match racing team 3-2 to advance to the semifinal round of the 71st Bermuda Gold Cup. 
Price, who finished third at the Bermuda Gold Cup in 2019, joins multiple winners Yanni Berenson, with whom we're speaking, from Sweden, Berenson Racing Team, Taylor Canfield's USA Stars Plus Stripes Team, and Ian Williams' Great Britain Team, representing China One Ningbo, in the next round, the three veterans combined to go 10-1. Mm. So of those three, they, they only lost. Somebody lost one match in the quarters, which included Berenson, as we mentioned a moment ago, winning four races to get the requisite three points after he'd been dinged a point to advance. Uh, who lost the other? Who lost the match, guys? Who was it? Uh, uh. I am really. No, we follow, missed that I, I didn't one. follow that. You're, come on, your live studio audience will know. <laughs> the live studio audience is just checking that one. We'll come back to that oh, one. Oh gosh. <laughs> Let's uh, look at another photo well, here. This is uh, Taylor Canfield on the right, on the starboard side here with Gavin. Taylor. With, Taylor. Taylor Canfield. Sorry, did I, what did I say? Taylor Canfield, of course. Taylor there on the right with Gavin Brady on the left in their quarterfinal match. Uh, how'd that come out? Besides was, Taylor winning. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Did Gavin, Nick, go, uh, get a race off Taylor? Yeah. yeah. He got one. That's yeah. okay. I never, guys, you know me well enough. Now. I never ask a question I don't know the answer to. <laughs> As, <laughs> and I'm not even a and I'm not even a lawyer. <laughs> okay, so that yeah, that's where that one that one uh, loss came to the top three. Here's just yeah. a video. If you want to do a, a little voiceover, it's from the islandstats.com local video. Tell us about your live television coverage. That maybe uh, hopefully it's going to happen tomorrow if you get some racing in. Um, it, it's not the, the tour production crew, but the club here have got someone doing some live coverage, uh, and there was a, a bit of coverage on Wednesday. And I think the, uh, the their intention is to have some coverage tomorrow if, if the sailing goes off. So we'll um, we'll make sure we put out a notice uh, so that anyone can watch. Um, if for whatever reason there's technical issues with that, we'll we'll try and pull out some phones and, and get in the thick of it. Great. Well, it's such a beautiful scene there on Hamilton Harbor. Uh, any, I've, I've judged and raced there as have a lot of the people who are watching today's show. will have a fabulous place and a fabulous regatta that's been going on, well, for 70 plus years. This is the 71st, right? Uh, 71st edition. Yeah, still on the same uh, race course, r right in the harbor. So that was the Hamilton Princess that they were sailing past there. So all the hotel guests, I think they've got a few conferences on this week, get a, get a pretty good view. And um, the, uh, the events using these uh, mark set bots for the first time this year, which is quite fun. So, and that's the local it. team. That's the Bermuda team there. It is, yeah. That's uh, they qualified through the through a local event here, the Bermuda Bermuda Match Racing Nationals, to get a spot into the event. And uh, Gavin uh, Brady got a slot into the event by um, being the highest placed after Chris Poole on the U.S. Grand Slam series. So. The great thing about this event is there's the multiple ways of of getting into the uh, getting into that group of sixteen, so um, which is good. Okay, so what happened to current U.S. match racing champ Chris Poole, who's been on a hot streak? Yeah, just um, really not his week uh, this week, unfortunately. He, um, you know, he's ha he's had a pretty good year with an undefeated win at the Congressional Cup, and then going on with the us championships and uh you know is here with a you know with a with a well uh, well versed team with Joachim Aschenbrenner and matt cornwell um on the on the bow and uh, yeah just just really hasn't been his week sadly um you know we've only really had one day of proper day of racing so um yeah it's uh, unfortunate for him now a couple of other teams of note we've got anna usling who is your women's match racing tour champion just uh, what, what was that in Denmark? The finals for that a week ago. They've had a they've had a very busy year, and just last week we were in Copenhagen where they secured the, um, the so the women's world match racing tour, which we launched just last year. This is the second season, mm -hmm. and uh, they won the uh, Pauline Courtois won the first year, and she's here as well. And then Anna Osling and the Wings team, as as they're known, won uh, won the tour. That's Pauline from last year, and then so Anna and the girls won this year's women's tour. Uh, but they've also been busy because they're also behind the Women's America's Cup campaign, which is um, now 
they've come together with Artemis Racing, which I'm sure you've you've seen and read about. Mm. So they're they're full steam ahead for the Americas Cup next year. So um, yeah, busy busy times for for them. Now, what happened to our Fozy, young Jeffrey Peterson, who at age 21 is one of the youngest, if not the youngest, ever to sail in this event? But yeah, uh, he didn't get through. Yeah, super team, really, really great bunch of guys. And, um, you know, they haven't been here before. They haven't sailed the boats here before. And, you know, just with, with not that much racing um, to to familiarize themselves, um, you know, sadly weren't, weren't able to get uh, the required points. But uh, they were getting to grips very quickly with the boats. You know, they're good, good, good guys. They're really, as, and as I know we've said before, really uh, one to watch, you know, not just Jeffrey, but the whole crew. So we're going to see more of them, I hope. Yanni, which boats are t- more difficult to, if for, especially for a newcomer, going to Congressional Cup and sailing those big, heavy, old, slow uh, boats, but good match racing boats, which are, which are more difficult to, um, what's the word I want to, uh, 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 not acclimatize, what's the word I want, Julia? Uh, just, uh, adapt, j- adapt, j- adapt to or? A, yeah. Jump into. Jump into. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, the young sailors uh, from today, they're coming through, I mean, most of them come from Optis, and then they may, may go into Ilka, or Laser, as it's called, used to be called, uh, or they go into 29er, 49er, and skiff sailing, which is faster boats. Uh, so for, for them, I think it's a bit more difficult to go into slower boats, more traditional boats. Um, but that's how the, the development are, and now now younger kids go very very fast into foiling. So there is a spectra of a lot of different boats to for them to learn. So so I think uh, it's I think it's harder for them to get into bigger boats with a bigger crew and heavy boats that are uh, a bit slow because it's so much of keeping up the speed, mm. uh, which is um, which is another a li- little little different of the skill that you have to have. So. But I mean, these these are good sailors. If they just do it once or two or three times, they will definitely go straight up. And uh, and Jeffrey and his team has shown their skills. And I mean, it's it's not that they are you know very very much behind now. Uh, they had they got two points during the round robin. And they would only need one or two more, definitely two more to get through. So and and they had a lot of close racing. So so that could easily happen next time. Now, let's uh, talk about your crew for a minute, because as we've noted, you went undefeated. You're having a, a good regatta. You've won it twice before, and the prospects look good for you tomorrow, whether you race or not. Tell us about the rest of your team. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm very appreciating that I have, um, uh, from, the, from the right, we have Bjorn Lundgren on the, on the main uh, sail, and the main sail on these boats are really big. So you need to have a really power on that sheet, and it's um, it's a really crucial trim uh, to to get the main sheeting right in these boats to get it fast. And Bjorn has been sailing with me for many years, uh, uh, back and forth. So so really great to have him. And it's a lot of good experience coming with him. And then uh, next to the right is uh, Patrick uh, Sturison, who's trimming. Uh, also started to sail with me two and a half years ago. Um, really skillful sailor has been a helmsman before, which is make it easier because he understands what I'm doing, and uh, that helps a lot uh, in our communication. He's trimming the jib and the, trimming the spinnaker. And then on the left we have a Herman who does a really, really great job calling the tactics. And uh, the tactics here in uh, Bermuda is, is crucial for winning the regattas. So of course, speed in the boat, but the tactics very, very important. That he has done a really, really good job so far, and I. I'm really pleasant to sail against, uh, to sail with him uh, in the regatta and uh, overall the year. A couple of comments here. Julie, you've got some spam comments there if you want to get rid of them. A positive aspect, Gordon Smith says, of the WMRT and match racing in general is that to be competitive, a breadth of experience on different boat types is essential. I see you nodding your heads yes, and I, I'm th- sure we all agree with Gordon in Denmark, outside of Copenhagen. Steve Gruber, who's a very savvy sailor, an American, he's saying the IODs are awesome for match racing, I-M-H-O, in his not-so-humble opinion. Yeah. Sounds like me. Uh, now, you're the leader, Yanni, going into the semifinals, and tomorrow at the skippers' meeting, 
you get to name which of the other three, which is the match racing tradition, which of the other three you will race in your semifinal. Any idea who that might be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance that you're going to reveal that here? <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, we'll see what happens. So we have the, to make the choice and um, we're going to pick, pick one of the other teams and depending on how we feel that day and who we want to want to race. So, and it yeah, won't but, necessarily be Harry price. Could be. That's one option. <laughs> <laughs> I even read in your press release, James, that the odds on, uh, the most likely choice by Yanni is that he will choose Harry price tomorrow. And the other two in the semis are repeat really of the 2020 championship. That was a fiercely fought battle between Taylor Canfield and Ian well, Williams, and there's a photo from that in 2020. Well, you know, press releases are allowed to be speculative. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have the, I have Harry's uh, parents here in the room, so I will have a discussion with them first and see how we yeah. decided. Well, yeah, you know, maybe there's some dark and stormies that can uh, cross the bar and a few other things, maybe. The, yeah, yes. I sure, Chris, Her, uh, Pricey, David Price and Christian are there. And uh, I might be sending them a text in the background. Go bribe Yanni. Go. Oh, there's a pan over to the live studio audience. We're waiting, we're waiting to give Johnny a check so yeah. that he can get into the bank before nightfall. <laughs> <laughs> we had Christian on uh, during the tech check, but she's shy now. She's not coming back. I thought maybe she'd come back over and sit with you all. But um, well, bravo, Zulu. Congratulations. To uh, to you, well, to you both, both on your success with the tour this year, and you know, I like to have here over my shoulder. We always have the world tour logo right here on the Crutonic yeah. set here on the desk set. But uh, you've really survived another great year and thrived, really, James. Terrific job, and now it looks like Yanni may be on the cusp of his third win. We don't want to jinx him, but uh, what do you think? Well, uh, you know me, I, I have to support everyone, but, you know, Johnny's he has been here before. Um, he knows the boats well. He's won twice here before, and they have had a good week so far. So, um, yeah, he's in, a good, he's in a good spot. And, of course, this isn't the final event of the tour. This is the penultimate event, and uh, we still have the final event of the, year to go, uh, of the year in Shenzhen in China in December. So more to come. And that's another boat with some... Very different conditions. Mm. Hopefully, not a not a tropical storm or a <laughs> hurricane. Indeed, and a nice comment as we wrap this up um, from Andrew Pindar, who has been very active as a sponsor on the tour over the years, Ian Williams and others. But uh, Yanni has done an incredible job. Andrew is saying maintaining his status in the elite of match racing, whilst holding down a senior IT position in the Swedish hospital system and also being one of the most respected and likable competitors. How nice. Well, isn't that nice, Julia? Yes, indeed. Yes, Thank you, Andrea. I should, add, I should add, and I don't know if they're watching, but um, both the tour and Johnny's team are sponsored by Pele P. So thank you, Pele P, for uh, keeping us in orange and blue as well. <laughs> That's nice. Yes. That is nice. Steve Gruber saying uh, in reply, he said, I trust it is sunny and warm in Scar." Scarborough. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I love a yacht club where even in the model room you can sport a Speedo. What does that mean? Staying that's right? Australian. <laughs> Is there somebody wearing a Speedo there in the model room? In the, I don't What's, know. Uh, Jody Shields is asking. Uh, everybody knows Jody, who's a regular on here. It's, it's early in Sydney. What time is it there? It's 0744. Well, they're on daylight time now, so on summertime, so it's not quite as early as it uh, used to be in the, that another show that takes that Jody Shields <laughs> says pricey is sober and it's dark. What's going on? <laughs> did pricey hear that? Yeah, he did. He did. He's not commenting. Stingray is trying for a finger wag. And uh, I don't think they wear speedos much in Bermuda uh, stingray. I think they wear Bermuda shorts. 
which is why I have I have shorts on today because it's so bloody hot here. I thought I'd Bermuda wear Bermuda my... shorts. Well, they are. They're my they're my at least my Newport, Rhode Island shorts, which is almost the same. Then a couple other comments. Uh, I don't know what that. Okay, enough of all that. Finally, I just want to go to this comment from Ian Williams, who, of course, hasn't won it since 06. The Gold Cup, he says, is such an iconic regatta on the World Match Racing Tour. It is a really important event to have on the tour and have it back on the tour, I think he means. Quote, it is special for me as it was the first WMRT regatta that I won back in 06. Although since then, I do not have the best record there. The boats are a challenge for us with the way we are set up, but that won't stop us trying as hard as we can to get as far in the competition as we can. So fantastic stuff from Ian Williams, who, as we mentioned, is in the semis against Taylor Canfield. While, uh, well, we don't know that. We don't know that, but it looks like the two of them are going to be in the semis, and it looks like maybe, just maybe, Yanni Berenson there on the left We'll yeah. choose our good friend, Harry Price, for the other semi, depending upon how the negotiation goes between Yanni and uh, Harry's parents, who are sitting there in our live studio. <laughs> we should also remember that Ian, even though he hasn't won since 2006, he was second last time. So he's always in the fight of the top. Uh, so, so he's always performing well here, even though I know his goal is also to win. Indeed. Gentlemen, anything else uh, to add to this really good overview of what's going on in Bermuda? Yes. I think we're good. If we could just uh, if we could just have this storm pass over so we can hopefully get a good day in tomorrow. That's that's the goal. And um, yeah, that's where we're at. And until then, it's probably to the bar for some negotiations for the uh, <laughs> semifinal pick. Do you think do you think there's any chance that before you guys go to the bar, we can get Christian in? next to you and just have a quick word with Christian. We haven't had her on the show in a while. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Keep it going. Look at this. There's a wild applause there yes. in the. Hello, Tom. Hi, Hello. Christian. How are you? I'm famous. Thanks. I'm in Bermuda. What could be wrong? Do you think Yanni's going to choose your son, Harry, as the, as the semifinalist opponent? No, no doubt at all. No doubt. <laughs> And who, who, what do you think? What are what are Harry's chances against Yanni coming out undefeated? Yanni's undefeated all, all week. Who knows? That's what I mean. Nor if we sail. And I love Yanni. So, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Pindar is saying that a Canfield-Williams match is a match much made in mischief and potential mayhem. I think both these semifinals, especially in Breeze, could be. Last we were last year and um, we were here in 2020 um, during COVID at the only world championship to run that year. And uh, if you, well, you can find it on YouTube, but uh, yeah, they had a pretty tough battle those two. And uh, let's just say the media boat came off worse. <laughs> and uh, I think there's still a, still a mark to show for it. But uh, yeah, those two are always, uh, always fun to watch. And yeah. It, we, we ran that video at least once, maybe a couple times, didn't we, Julia? Yeah. There's Somers Kemp is on. He says he in Bermuda from the famous Kemp family in Bermuda saying, put the fenders out. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, uh, tell us what happened. You were during the tech check. You, you uh, sat down next to James and told us what you thought had happened to our mutual friend, JP. Well, I think Jeffrey had uh, a welcome to ODIs, but he improved as every race that went on. He was in a different group to us, to Harry, but I'm so impressed with this young man. He really is uh, going to be a force to be reckoned with, and I think um, give him give him some time, and he'll he'll smash this. I think his mom's probably happy he he's back in school. He had, he's in Georgetown. He's a what a sophomore. Yeah, yeah. I think they flew back early. No, uh, no, his team's here. Oh, <laughs> oh his team's there. He went home. Yeah. They're, oh, they're partying. Home. Good for but him. He, he really is. He's such a fine young man and a credit. Yeah. yeah, he's a good friend of ours. He's been on the show any number of times, as you will both know, as has the family price. Jonathan Frank, the last comment we'll give to him. He's saying, start mixing the gel coat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Christian, anything to add? Go, Harry. What does David, what's your husband, Pricey, have to say? I don't know, but it's a team event, and we have the Wind Whisperer. Her name is Julia Lyons. She is the most drop-dead beautiful young lady you have ever seen. She's from and, Bermuda. And she's the Wind Whisperer. Mm. Aha. <clears throat> she's our secret. Is she there in the studio? No, she's at work. Oh. <laughs> she works for Renaissance Ray. She is, without doubt, one of the fine young women of this country, and... Oh, I wish she, she was coming to Australia. <laughs> uh, while we've got you, Christian, tell us a little bit about Olivia Price's. Uh, she's having a really good go in the, in the FX, the 49er FX, for her Olympic campaign, as well as doing the America's Cup women's campaign from Australia, is she not? She's a busy little poppet. She got engaged about four weeks ago, so uh-huh. she's a fair bit on. But... The AC40 is going to be so exciting for the women of this world. I was talking to Anna Osling this week. I tell you, these women are going to rock Barcelona. Mm. It's going to be very exciting, and I really hope that everyone gets behind them. It would be really handy for a sponsor or six to come on board. So anyone that's got some spare change, perhaps they could ring organising authorities everywhere, but particularly in Australia. Thanks very much. (laughs) Peter Rigby is the guy to get in touch with. Thank you. Well, that's good. That's that's very good. Uh, Denise Peterson is chairing for Harry. Her comment here is "Go Harry." Mm-hmm. And uh, Jody's. I'm not quite sure what Jody's uh, Jody Shields comment. Love, Love Island. Island. Love Island. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Anything else, Julia? Anything for either of these two, or if uh, he's still an earshot for Yanni? Uh, yes, I have nothing in particular. It's just a joy to have have you on. Indeed. So okay. lovely to see you, Julie. I don't often get to chat to you. I chat to Tom a lot. Lovely I, to see you, darling. I know. Well, I'll have to get him to share on that a little bit. Well, you all have each other's email and you have each other's Facebook. It's I love all... Facebook. She puts up some great photos. She does, we'll, uh, indeed. We'll keep you posted yep. with uh, storms and uh, dark and stormies and everything else is happening in this club while there's no sailing going on. Yeah, there's well, a lot of partying. Well, enjoy your Friday night there. It's what, you're four hours ahead of us, so it's 17.52, almost 1,800 time for probably a cocktail. Tritium Racing is saying, nice interview. That must be John Sangmaster, I would assume, down in Long Beach. But thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Say thanks especially to Yanni. And uh, we'll be following it closely tomorrow. I hope you get some racing, and I really do. There's Yanni. Oh, there is. (laughs) All right. We'll see you. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Ciao, ciao for now. Yeah. Oh, what a treat. Yes, indeed. Huh, Julia? Absolutely. That, of course, is James Pleasance, who is from Great Britain. He is the World Match Racing Tour Executive Director. We've known him a long time. I, I still th- think he's done such an excellent job of building that whole program. I'm, I'm in awe of him. Well, he's not only built it, but then he's rescued it. Yes. And, and brought it back. And you're absolutely right. Terrific stuff. Ted Ryman is saying, great guests. Great to have live chat from an event, Gordon Smith saying. Mm-hmm. And Singray agreeing, James Pleasance is always a huge pleasure. Please, thank you. Thank you to both of them as we move forward with our, what is normally our opening segment, but today, uh, John uh, was gracious and said, I think we'll push it to the B block so that we can go live because they're, they're a bit busy <laughs> down yeah, there yeah. in their evening now in Bermuda. Thanks again. If you're just joining us, the show number 653 for Friday the 6th of October. Their, and now Their weather's got to be something to deal with. Say again? Their weather has is a lot to deal with. Well, I, I've looked at, I also as did um, Clark. Clark. I looked yeah. and it looks like it's going to be breeze on tomorrow. I think they're all. Yeah. So let's get to uh, the coach's corner with our super fozy, John Emmett, who's reporting in from the farm. Hi, Tom, Julia, and all the Fozzy, and welcome to Coach's Corner. Today, I'm going to talk to you from the farm about celebrating success. Not sure whether I'm going to be able to join you on the live show. I'll do my best, but I will be driving back to Weymouth for another fun weekend at Castle Cove Sailing Club. So, yeah, bit of time on the water, bit of time at home, trying to get that balance right and make the most of what I guess is a very brief off season because in the Olympic year, in this case 2024, most of the major championships, the World Championships, etc., 
even European Championships are very early in the year so as to separate them from the Olympic Games. But anyway, back to the main topic, celebrating success. And in coaching, it, for me, it needs to be carrot and stick. I know some uh, coaches are more in favour than one than other, but you reward success. And I was going to say punish, but that's not that's not quite the right word. But um, you, you need to try and remove those bad habits. So you reward the success, you praise the success, but you need to acknowledge the failures because by realizing what went wrong, then you really have the opportunity to improve for the future. And you just need to be really honest with yourself. So you need to know, you know where I am now, where I'm trying to get to, and that honest conversation means you can move forward. If you make an excuse, uh, you can never uh, really progress. It's sort of like um, when you listen. So <clears throat> you should always be listening to hear what somebody's saying, or I even think you're listening to ask a question. So you're listening and you're trying to, to get as much from what they're saying as possible, maybe even ask a question to make sure you fully understood. Whereas it's very easy to listen or for that, even not really listen and to spend that time just trying to uh, formulate a response. And, and that's why, you know, if people go into the defensive mode, defending them, themselves, then it's very hard uh, for them to take new information on board. And I think we have very high stress regattas now. <clears throat> And the time between races is really small. I, you know, a lot of people think that coaching is me following sailors around with a video camera, uh, but a lot of it is helping through the regatta support. And that time between the first and the second race of the day, that could be really small. So the people who, you know, just refocus, reframe and get on with it are always going to be more successful in the second race than people who are perhaps uh, backwardsly focus, thinking backwards or, or even sort of sulking what went wrong or the rest of it, the previous race. So you need to open your mind, move on. And that is a very uh, top tip for successful sailors. And we need to celebrate that success. So as a coach, obviously, we need to point out what went wrong so we can fix it, but also, you know, to acknowledge when things have gone well and what we did that went well so we can repeat it and, and habit, you know, success is a habit and what we practice becomes permanent. So this time of year, uh, a lot of the, the countries, the MNAs and indeed World Sailing are going to be looking at celebrating success. So for us, the Rolex Sailor of the Year Award is a really uh, important thing. I mean, it was such a big thing and I'm so terribly proud that, that Lily had that in 2012 and that really capped off a, a, an excellent year. So this celebrating success, we should do that. But not only for the, the, for the elite performers, you know, those uh, people who generate enthusiasm in the sport, the volunteers, the club officials who really make the, the whole sailing world go round. So today's topic, we need to celebrate success. Okay. I was thinking that it, it, if they don't already, it'd be important to, <clears throat> to introduce Lily to the, to, uh, the World Match Racing Tour. I think they are. I think James knows her well and knows John, and oh, uh, but it's a good point. She could do some. Yeah, she's such a great commentator. She I mean, is. You would just you would hope that uh, anyone. I think she's darn busy though with all her work in China. Well, that will be in China. Well, exactly. Oh, I see what you're saying. To when they go for the yeah. finals. Yeah. And I think in December. Good point. Interesting point. Okay. Well, thanks, John, for that report. As always. By the way. I had a bit, as I usually do, or at least often do, I had a bit of a chit and chat with John by text. He said, uh, I said, when I were going to move this to the B block, he said, no problem. I think I might make it home in time. He was at the family farm mm -hmm. as, and then he's driven home to Weymouth. And he said, but before I go, I'm currently having a beer with my mom. Oh, how nice. And it is. And John's, that's his yes. mom, Marilyn, who we've met before on this show, who is, between you and I in, in age, Julia, mm -hmm. and she's just fabulous. As we've, we've had her on the show briefly. She yes. said a few words once. She did, yes. She's a little more shy than John, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, but just as, just as uh, straightforward in it. And she it's is. Fun. Yeah. So everybody's talking about John looking dangerously close, close to King Henry V or the <laughs> Sixth or whoever, all of them suddenly got beheaded or maybe <laughs> Father Time, Father Christmas. And Gordon Smith agreeing that celebrating small successes is important to improvement. It sure is. And the art of listening. Yeah. And Michael Frank said, what's that? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you for that. John Emmett Sailing. 
gets to the front of the fleet. We got another report from John. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's often at Ilka regattas and interviewing Ilka right. sailors, right. but he's done an interesting uh, diversion and taken up with a kite foiler. Aha. Uh-huh. And a top British kite foiler. And I think you will enjoy this segment. This is with Ellie Aldridge from Great Britain, mm-hmm. who is the IKA Women's European Champion a couple of weeks ago. The, the championship was in Portsmouth in the UK. Mm-hmm. And John interviewed her just, uh, I believe, yesterday. Ah. So the British sailing team has lots of incredibly talented individuals in all 10 Olympic classes. Now, I spend a lot of my time chatting to Ilka sailors. Now, time for something completely different. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, My name's Ellie Aldridge and I am a kite foiler. Not just a kite foiler, you're the current European champion. Can you just tell us a little bit about that regatta? You're just back home in Weymouth, but uh, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, so the Europeans uh, this year was in Portsmouth in the UK. It was a couple of weeks ago and um, yeah, I won overall, so I'm really happy. I mean, you're not going to be unhappy with a win, but it wasn't, it wasn't, and the pun is completely deliberate. It wasn't all plain sailing, a bit of waiting around, I guess, when uh, it was incredibly windy at the beginning of the regatta. And uh, the format is a bit different to what we normally have for dinghy classes, isn't it? Yeah, so we normally have five days of fleet racing, but we missed the first two because it was too windy. So we had three days of fleet racing. And then for us on the final day, instead of having a medal race or a final day of racing, we have a final series which is a little bit complicated um, basically if you're top two in the qualifying you go straight to a final and if you're from third place to tenth place you go into two semi-finals and then from the winners from the two semi-finals join first and second in the final and then there's a battle out to to win overall and, it, and at the final race you you've got a bit of uh, friendly weed <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, (laughs) yeah, in the first final race, uh, so I qualified in first, so I was winning um, going into the final, and I was winning the last, well, the first race of the final final, and, um, yeah, got lots of seaweed on my foil and crashed just before the finish line, Um, so everyone overtook me, so, um, yeah, I didn't finish that race, but luckily... um, we did another race and I won the next race, so. And, that, uh, <laughs> and that's what I had Because what happens, because with your with your lines and stuff, if you have a crash, it's not just like a, a, a dinghy where you get back in, you do you get tangles and things going on? Yeah, so I, I yeah, I fell off my foil, so I crashed, but also my kite, um, one of the wing tips came in a bit and then it ended up going into the water. So it's, you gotta look out for, you can fall off your board, but you've also gotta look out for your kite that can sometimes do some crazy stuff. If it's, if the wind's a bit gusty, um, they have a mind of their own sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad it's not just boats that do that. But you, you come from, if you like, a more traditional sailing background. If I first met you in a, an FX, and when I used to campaign the 49er, I thought they were really quick. Actually, they're now, medium boats with you for the four foilers at the Olympic Games or should I say five foilers so much faster but how did you get into the kite surfing and how did you start sailing in the first place um yeah so I grew up in pool so I grew up sailing um, my whole family so for the folks at home that's just down the road yeah. they it wouldn't take you very very yeah. far to sail though would it yeah no it wouldn't it's about an hour drive so it wouldn't take very long to kite there um and yeah i grew up kind of looking at the 49 of being thinking that that was the really fast cool boat and i wanted to sail that i'd say it's still a cool boat yeah no but... it, is. <laughs> it is definitely but that was uh something that i definitely aspired to and then when i was sailing the fx the kite foiling became a new olympic sport and I always started up a kite for gold program like a talent search initiative to find more female kiters that could race and um compete on the world world tour so i right right place right time yeah a little bit yeah i yeah applied for applied for it just because i thought it looked really fun and i kind of i could do a bit of kite surfing already and um, i'm sure that helps <laughs> yeah yeah although it yeah you learn quite quick um but yeah, so I applied for it and then sort of ne- never really looked back that much. <laughs> I mean, i would just be interested to know in terms of the racing, what's the, the sort of similarities and difference for people who are making that, that transition? Because I, mean, I would like to think in a biased way it helps having race thingies. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the hardest bit 
looking at kite foiling is it looks so different and it, it does take a bit of time to begin with you've got to learn to kite surf and then you've got to learn to foil and then you've got to put it all together and get around a course without falling over which did it, i mean it probably took about a year or from the beginning to you say take a bit of time that sounds very quick <laughs> well I, a year of like full time <laughs> um but a year from a year of starting out not really knowing anything to being able to race so it is it does take a bit of time and a bit of persistence you've got to keep keep doing it and to begin with it can feel like a completely different world but then as soon as you can do that and you start racing it is almost ex it is exactly the same as sailing it just happens faster and i guess it's a one-way ticket we're not going to see you back in a in a dinghy just for i don't know i mean i wouldn't rule it out but, but i don't know you don't know, because I know quite a few uh, Ilka sailors who go foiling for fun. I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't didn't see that many foilers who go Ilka sailing <laughs> yeah. for fun. And that was meant to be a beautiful uh, segue. Uh, your partner, Mickey, doing very good things in the Ilka 7. So what do you do now? You've got a bit of, bit of home life. Yeah, it's a bit of maintaining house, <laughs> house stuff that I've kind of neglected. We got most of the work done beginning of the year so that we could live there and then uh, there's a lot of half finished jobs that I definitely yeah definitely neglected over the summer so now is kind of time to go back and finish all the unfinished jobs. I'm, I'm not going to say anything because I've, I've got unfinished jobs for 20 years ago <laughs> because there's always something else but how does it work because obviously you've got quite different uh, schedules with the regattas and we're getting to the tail end of that Olympic cycle now aren't we? Yeah I mean we both yeah quite often especially in the winter away doing different things but normally when mickey's away doing something i'm away doing something else um and then yeah this year and i guess next year we'll be in the summer we'll be doing quite a lot of the same events so it's quite nice to travel around and go from event to event i mean i guess spending as much time in marseille as you can yeah pretty much i think <laughs> so yeah um but yeah like the times the times when we have events together is is really nice and it kind of makes up for when we're doing other different things on our own absence and uh, heart growing fonder and all that well thanks very much it's been really lovely to to talk to you and i do try very hard to follow your racing thanks <laughs> thank you nice yes. stuff very don't you think yeah absolutely you see what chapin or uh, first of all stinger Stingray, is. yeah she looks world class happy and healthy really impressive right she is impressed with a go from a an fx from a 49er to kiting yes and be at the top of the heap basically yeah. literally in a year um, it's probably been more than a year but to, she said to learn to get up to speed in a year i uh, take me the rest of my life and then some yeah. uh clark chapin yeah uh, i i was going to take issue with what clark said he said it, it isn't a ringing endorsement for kite foiling as an olympic discipline if a single bit of seaweed can take you out of race but that's really true of a single bit of seaweed on your ilka yeah. rudder or centerboard or your flying scott clark or your inner leg yep you know, at our home lake where you can get a piece of uh, weed on your, but I, <laughs> Julia, ah, when he talked about friendly weed, I was wondering where this I was, was too. <laughs> where this was going. I thought maybe we I had uh, some kind of a cannabis, maybe we have to I turn know. this I, into I, a, I a cannabis yeah. show with a sailing habit instead of <laughs> a, sure we'd make Stingray happy. Uh, but yeah, some people took some issues with Clark's comments. So I think that's, Foiling high off the water and weed do not mix. <laughs> I thought weed kept you higher. There we go. Stingray, that's much. A great interviewer always gets the best out of their guests. Yeah, and John does better. I mean, he's been good for a long time, but he yeah. gets better and better and he better. He does. Emmett is saying himself, he's saying, I would expect an RYA announcement about the BST, the British Sailing Team, including Ellie and Mickey very soon. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Thanks very much for that, John. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. By the way, just a couple other photos. This was the Europeans, the Formula Kite the Europeans. Uh, you know, the sailors call themselves kite kite foilers, and it's the IKA Formula Kites, the technical name. There she is in the top of the podium there, Ellie Aldridge. Mm -hmm. And I really also want to draw your attention, in case you missed it, in the discussion between John and Ellie. I like the format. Instead of the medal race, they go racing, the final four. And how you get there is another issue, the top two. and the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. But once you get the final four, I like the idea that you keep racing until somebody wins three. 
Mm-hmm. That's see the score score line there. Ellie's got a one one retired in the third race, and then another one, and that's how she took the gold because yeah. it's the first team, first sailor, first rider as they call themselves, yeah, to win three, three races. I like it. What do you all think? As a as a you know, even if that were the okay, you're not going to do that in the medal. Well, maybe if you had four teams, and you. Uh, had four teams or even three teams in the, say the finals of the Ilka instead of a medal race where winner take all and it's can be crutonic or somebody can have already won before you get to the medal race. That's even more crutonic. What do you all think of that? Uh, Joe Holtzman saying weeds in Portage Lake. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I don't know. Joe, when was the last time you sailed there, but on our home, home little lake where Clark Chapin and Joe and others, a few others of you on here will have been sailing. It's um uh, it can be weedy. This is the shallow spots. The, it's where the sun gets down through the water. And the water, in fact, it's interesting, the clearer, the cleaner the water is, the clearer it is, the more the sun can get down to the shallower spots and it promotes the growth of weeds from the shallow spot. And then you want to be sure not to sail through them. Or if you do, you got to clean your centerboard and runner. So here was their final results. I just stuck this in. In fact, not the results. These are the world rankings in the kite boarding, the women's kite board, the, the IKA formula kite as of the 5th of September. And there is the French lady, Poema, Poema Newland, and Lorraine Nola, another French lady is in second. These are the rankings. Now, this is, uh, I, I guess, prior to the Europeans. So they probably changed since then. Gal Zuckerman from uh, Israel. In third, Eleanor, whom we just saw interviewed, Ellie Aldridge is fourth ranked overall. And our own Daniela Morose, Julia, who is going to host, I see, she's going to host the St. Francis Sailing Foundation Foundation. dinner. Mm -hmm. Was that next week? The fundraiser for our Olympians in this country. Mm -hmm. And she, she, Daniela Morose, who's been at the top of this heap, and now she's maybe not at the top of the heap anymore. We'll see how she does. She was for 10 years or something. You know? Well, exactly. Several times, what, three, four times, maybe even five times, Yachts Woman of the Year in yeah. this country, Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year. So there's the uh, rankings, and thanks again to John for those terrific interviews. Uh, this day in history, 7th of October, the date, the year almost for sure gives it away, Julia. What happened in this date in history in 1492? Columbus theoretically yeah. discovered America. Columbus sailed the ocean. It uh, As kids, we were growing up. In 1492, right. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He sailed and sailed and sailed and sailed to find this land for me and you. How's that for something from like first grade? I th- I'm very proud of I'm it. I'm sure I've not sung that since first grade. Not even in rehearsal. <laughs> Well, it has to do with Columbus, but it's not what you might think. Mm-hmm. But what you might think. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is the, you know what that is? We're tying this into the America's Cup. Uh, that is the Monumento a Colon, who, of course, was Italian. Cristobal mm-hmm. Colon, 1451 to 1506. Mm-hmm. That's in Barcelona, that monument. You see oh, that right yeah. in the middle of the circle, just mm-hmm. up from the Yacht Club and look overlooking the harbor. He, 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 you know, you all know the story. He had to talk, he tried to talk three different, the Italian royalty, the Spanish royalty. I think he even tried the Portuguese royalty and the, I didn't know he went to, he sent his brother to the UK to try to get the British royalty of the time to back his expedition. Mm-hmm. And he finally, of course, got uh, Ferdinand and Isabella from Spain to back it. And you see here uh, the blue line this, the blue one is his first voyage, and he takes off here from Palos, in the south of Spain, goes across. And remember, they didn't have chronometers. They didn't know the whole idea of, of you know, lines of longitude. They, did, they yeah. didn't know where they were. But he was convinced he was going where? To China. Well, to, to India. To the, oh, India. To the Indies. And he gets about here, and you see these, these little variations? He's following birds, apparently. I I didn't research this extensively. Maybe some of you know better. But right about there, he turns to the left because he sees some birds. Mm -hmm. And that, on this day, was the day he made that turn, supposedly, from his diaries and various other papers. 
on that day, this day, and it's actually the seventh, but you know, it's the seventh from where you all are under, down under. He misses Florida when he changed course. <laughs> he didn't find North, well, if North America, if you include Cuba. Yeah. So this is, I've seen this painting. This is in our uh, Capitol building in the U.S., Oil on Canvas by John Vanderlyn, 1846, just five years before the Modern America's Cup, the landing of Columbus. And of course, he landed in San Sal, what, what, what do they call that? But down there, he, Cuba, really, one of the uh, Bahamian Islands. Columbus's expeditions inaugurated, a, and by the way, this is our Columbus Day weekend. Right. Some people call it the indigenous peoples and so, right. a few other things. It's it hugely celebrated in Spain and Italy, by the way. And San Francisco. Is it here because of the Italian population? Yes. Oh, yes, early on. And that's what the jets flying around is all part of this Columbus Day weekend and so on, right? It's, uh, no, in San Francisco, it's now part of indigenous. Oh, it's, oh, we're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day here. But This but, is the communist country of San Francisco. <laughs> but but it started out uh, as, as a Columbus Day. There's well, a of huge, course. Huge uh, Italian... Uh, population. Well, he supposedly landed on the 12th of October, which is why Columbus Day has been the 12th of October until they made it the whatever, second Monday or whatever it is now. But back to the story here, it, it is significant that his expeditions inaugurated a period of exploration, conquest, and colonization that lasted four centuries, mm -hmm. thus bringing the Americas into the European sphere of influence. So, you know, at least it was that. Right. The transfer of commodities, ideas, and people between the old and new worlds that followed his first voyage are known as the Columbian Exchange. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of that. These no. events and the effects which persist to the present are often cited as the beginning of the modern era. Well, that's probably true. Columbus was widely celebrated in the centuries after his death, but public perception fractured in the 21st century due to greater attention to the harms committed under his government. He was apparently horrible. You know, he wasn't very bright, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. Under his governance, particularly the beginning of the depopulation, some would call it worse than that, mm -hmm. of Hispaniola's indigenous Tainos, caused by old world diseases and mistreatment, including slavery. Many places, he took a bunch of slaves home. Yeah. Many places in the Western Hemisphere bear his name, including Colombia, British Columbia, and of course, Columbus, Ohio. I left that in just for you, Julie Aarons the home of Ohio, the Ohio State University, which we from Michigan never mentioned. <laughs> uh, I like this. I saw this somewhere. Christopher Columbus set out and didn't know where he was going. He arrived and didn't know where he was. And he returned not knowing where he had been. All, and all on borrowed money. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I, deal, I like that statement. Mm -hmm. So it was on this day, it was the 7th, actually, according to his diary, 7th of October, 1492, that he made that fateful left turn and discovered Cuba, <laughs> not, mm -hmm. not Florida. Uh, P.S. In Columbus's letter on the first voyage, published following his return to Spain, he claimed that he had reached Asia. He could not believe that he had not reached Asia, yeah. as previously described by Marco Polo and other Europeans. Over his subsequent voyages, Columbus refused to acknowledge that the lands he visited and claimed for Spain were not part of Asia, even in the face of mounting evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. This might explain in part why the American continent was named after the Florentine, the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci, mm -hmm. who received credit for recognizing it as a new world and not named after Columbus. How do you like that? That's a yes. P.S. Yes, that's nice. Okay. Enough of all that. And I haven't, I haven't heard any jets, Julie. I don't know if it's foggy over the bay. I wonder if it's horribly foggy in there. I, I don't it's know. It's not here in the marina. It's bright and clear here yeah. in the marina. Yeah, well, it's not quite Sunny time. and clear. I thought it was at 1 o'clock. Well, no? the, the, uh, I think festivities begin at one o'clock. Oh, okay. So maybe there's other things going on. Hopefully, but, I mean, hopefully we'll get done with the show before the, the Clark uh, Chapin. Sorry, go ahead. The uh, Jets start at three. The the Blue Angels. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Every, every yeah, they were rehearsing yesterday at one. It was just Kurtonic. Mm 
Everybody, I couldn't hear myself think here in the studio preparing the show. Everybody sing with me. God bless Vespucci, Vespucci land, <laughs> land that I love. Okay. Steve Gruber, I try not to get political here, but I will be signing off now with this celebration of the murder of Columbus. I think Columbus was Venetian. Well, he was Italian, whatever he was. Thank you. Refining Gordon Smith, I sent a video to Tom about the issue and lack of funds. Maybe he can share it soon. Yeah, we're we're going to work, Jay. We're still working on that. I know she's back. Her, you're the uh, American uh, 470 team that uh, we're going to do a little bit of. Uh, she's going to be on the show, but she's back training in Marseille now. Uh, America's Cup, speaking of money, a bit of America's Cup news. AC 37 Cup date that came out this morning. Mr. Dalton has signed up Coca-Cola. Okay. As uh, they have an agreement with Martorreyes, Barcelona, the plant there, the Coca-Cola plant, through which the company becomes a sponsor of the 37th America's Cup, the world's oldest and most important nautical event to be held in Barcelona a year from now. This alliance makes Coca-Cola the global soft drinks partner of the 37th edition of the America's Cup. There's nothing more global than Coca-Cola. Well, indeed. It's one of the top brands, along with the Christian Cross and the Apple logo and one or two, other, Nike swoosh, maybe one or two others. Well, before we leave the America's Cup, we have a nice, another nice America's Cup history challenge from Ed Worley. Oh, good. And new music. What do you think of the music? I like the music. Huh? I like and it. In fact, I liked it so much, I found it. I thought I'd leave it on right through the slides. And this has to do with 1974, Mariner versus Valiant. At least that's what this photo is. The Defender Trials in 1974. And Ed asks, who from the failed Mariner defense, remember the boat that had the chopped off underbody, who from the Mariner defense was asked to sail aboard Courageous to help defend the cup in 74 after Mariner was eliminated. Was it Dennis Connor, Gary Jobson, Rod Stevens, or Ted Turner? A, Dennis Connor, B, Gary Jobson, C, Rod Stevens, or D, Ted Turner? Do you wanna go first, Julia? Wasn't it Ted Turner's time? It was, he was the skipper of the boat. Was he then asked to go off the boat? And if he was asked, did he agree? Is <laughs> maybe the bigger question. Oh. Clark Chapin thinks that Columbus was in Genoa. Enios T6 had a major dramatic equipment failure in testing. Yeah, I heard that, Ed. Okay, now that we've got the cola, who's going to supply the rum, Clark Chapin? <laughs> Baton Rouge says DC. Ted Ryman says D, Ted Turner. Fritz Mueller says Gary Jobson. Graham Sweeney is asking if it's Gary Jobson, BB. So does Gordon Smith. Julie thinks it's Ted Turner. Tierra DeYoung, Dennis, question mark. That question is both, it's pointed at both ends. <laughs> clever Jonathan Frank. Yes. That's clever Jonathan Frank. Yes, yes. Jonathan Frank thinks it's Dennis. Any other, uh, any other suppositions, any other answers before we give you the answer? Sangre, Coca-Cola, oh, he's back on the America's Cup, is now the global soft drinks partner. Am I am looking forward to the announcement of the global bed pillows partner? <laughs> MyPillow.com. Yep. Okay, I think that's about it. And we will give you the answer here. The answer is, there's your clue. Any idea yet? There's your clue. Oh, there's Dennis. That's Dennis in the back. That's Ted Hood in the front, the late, great Ted Hood. Dennis, of course, still with us. And the answer is A, Dennis Connor. And the real, the, the skinny, uh, the, the rest of the answer is that Dennis was recruited as starting helmsman on Courageous to help Skipper Ted Hood win the right to defend the cup when he was struggling. He, Ted Hood, was struggling to win against Intrepid in the very close 1974 defense trials. Yeah, defender trials. Graham Sweeney, Dennis the Menace. Many think DC's first win was 1980 with freedom, but they don't realize that his actually his first America's Cup win was 74 with Hood and Courageous. Hmm. 
Thank you, Ed Worley. Another America's Cup history challenge, along with a new theme. I hope you like it. I like that. You like that? Yeah. Mm. You approve? I do. Okay, I hope Ed does too. I told him I was going to, if I had time this morning, to put, put some music to his segment. We also have, we got great segments today. Not only the live segment, but uh, Emmett and Worley. And now we have an AAAA, believe it or not. Oh, good. And a really interesting bit on a new event that's been happening in Europe and now apparently is going to happen in Australia, thanks to Alistair's awesome Aussie anecdote, which comes today from the Royal Brighton Yacht Club, just down the shore from downtown Melbourne, and south of St. Kilda. And it was there that he brought on a gentleman who is an Olympic gold medalist in 2000 named Mark Turnbull. G'day, Tom, Julia, and all the fosey. This is AAAA, Alice, Alistair's awesome Aussie anecdote for you, okay. for you Mark. Um, we're sitting down here at uh, Royal Brighton Yacht Club, which you can see in the background, one of uh, Australia's premier clubs, and uh, a bit dreary today, a bit, bit, uh, bit, bit, bit wet. But I've got a real um, treat for you today. I want to introduce you to one of my mates. Um, as you know, I like to introduce you to great and interesting people um, during the segment. And I'm sitting here with Mark Turnbull, OAM, and Mark is a an Olympic gold medalist. Yes, thanks, Al. Yeah, and uh, yeah, what'd you win that in? Uh, in the oh, a long time ago now, yeah. 23 years ago in the 470 class. 23 bus. years. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> feels like yesterday. Yeah, and uh, what was the whole lot? Uh, that was so. For those that don't know, yes, it was uh, 2000 with his uh, teammate uh, Tom King. Yep. And it was in in the uh, 470 when Australia won gold in both the men's and the women's. Yes. How yeah. good was that? It was a great day, and I think it was one or two days after um, the 26th when the Australia 2 won the America's Cup. Oh, so yeah. it was a really good month for Australian sailing. Yeah. Well, we've just been celebrating that, of course, uh, the 40-year anniversary. Yep. And the last segment, the last two segments I've done for uh, Sailing Illustrated okay. have been about that America's Cup uh, okay. reunion. So yeah, no, that that was fantastic, and. Um, the whole Olympics experience, what did, what did that mean to you, Mark? Oh, How good was it? It was amazing. It was my first Olympics. Um, so I teamed up with Tom in 96. He'd just finished Atlanta. Yep. Um, and we were really fortunate. We had Victor Kovalenko come along as the coach of the Australian I've, team. I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so. I think you might know Victor. <laughs> the medal maker. I called him the medal maker. Yeah. No, you take that name. Yeah. So and yeah. that stuck, and rightfully so. So um, we were the first team, I guess, to benefit from um, him turning us from good local sailors yeah. um, into um, athletes. I guess that's probably the discipline, um, yeah, the discipline and the mentality to actually dominate and go out there at the Olympic Games and um, and try to dominate, which is yeah. sort of came true. Hell of a guy, isn't he? Amazing. Yeah, like, one of a kind. He's got an artistic eye. He sees the world differently than anyone else I know. And um, yeah, to have known Victor and still yeah. know Victor yeah. um, is a treat. To know him is to love him. Yes, and hate him. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. It's a yin well, and yang. Well, I've never been coached by him, so I can't comment on that. So, Mark, let's talk a bit about what you're doing today, um, the Sailing Champions League yep. and uh, kicking it off here in Australia. And, uh, and, and, and just talk to Tom and Julia and all of Fosey about what um, what the league is and what yeah. it's all about and what, what, what your hopes and expectations are for it. Yeah, so the league sailing or the Sailing Champions League is um, a club versus club competition. So I come from the Olympic background and worked on Volvo Ocean Race and that elite level, but club sailing is what drives our sport. And strangely enough, there's not a great level playing field club versus club competition worldwide. But about 12 years ago, it started in Germany um, by creating what was the Bundesliga there. They basically said, well, what do sports like soccer, in fact, what do every other sport do? And they do, um, they create a league for their clubs to compete. So yeah. the best sailors from each club complete on a level playing flat platform. So in our case, seven metre sports boats, so four or five people on each boat. Um, it's not age restricted, so it could be 16 year old kids versus a 65 year old. Um, in supplied equipment, lots of races take all the good stuff from match racing and teams racing, but put it in a fleet racing format. So we've um, brought that to Australia. It's in, what, 23 different countries have leagues around the world, including yep. America. Um, and to create a platform so the small little clubs can uh, beat the big, uh, the big established clubs. Um, mm. So it's starting, um, we're getting there, we're getting traction. Um, in Australia, but in, but in Europe, it's... It, in we, Europe, there's like 19 countries have different Is it on a leagues. roll? Like is it's it, huge. It's, like, on, it's on, on its way up? Yes, yep. yeah, so the sailors love it, um, yeah. the clubs love it. 
and the members of clubs love it because they're barracking and supporting their team, their club. So uh, yeah, it's just starting here, but um, China is starting league, India. So in this part of the world, I think there's huge gains, and Australia yeah. especially. New York's done pretty well with their invitational event. Yep. In New York Club. Yeah, it's it's removing the boat ownership issue. Yeah. Um, because not everyone can own a boat. Um, yeah. So supplying boats, um, so the best sailors win. Yeah. That's important. And it's not it's not high tech. It's not foiling. It's not this sexy end of the sport. Sometimes it's actually the sailing that people do at clubs every day of the week. And here you're using the RS21? Yes, um, or the, so we have a fleet of RS21s, awesome little boats, so um, yeah, we invested in that. But we also use Elite 7s, Elite 6s, um, SB20, so the type of boat, the actual boat doesn't matter, it's the mm. format of the racing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we also run a mixed format, so two girls, two guys on every boat, which is, actually makes a better event. Speaking of the RS20, I want to see our, our good friend Robbie Davis just came second in the Worlds. Yes. And I couldn't believe this. I looked at the scoreline in 10 races. The guy that won the regatta, Robbie beat him in every single one of the first five races. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, he's... Had him put away. And then the other guy beat him in, this, in all, every single one of the next five races. Okay. Unheard of. Yeah. yeah. No, pretty special. Actually, so. yeah. But no, for, <clears> for them to go over there and take, like, it's massive in Europe and the Italians are really strong and professional in the RS21. Yeah. So, yeah, what they did was um, a shock. It was amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep uh, Tom and the Fozzie well informed of this event of yours. So let's yep. let's check back well, in you within in weeks to come and months to come. Yep. I would have got you to bring your gold medal with you, Mark. Um, if I thought <laughs> of it, a bit ahead, we'll do that at the next uh, chat fun, we have. Yeah. But perhaps you could fin just finish off by talking about your um, your greatest disappointment in your in your sailing life, Mark. Yeah, you always bring this up, Alistair. Um, it would have to be when. Um, Alistair invited me to compete and crew for him at the Taser World Championships and then about a month later uninvited me because I think he found someone better. So um, at that point I had to go on and win a gold medal just to prove him wrong. So yeah, that's the biggest disappointment. So how's that folks? I dumped a gold medalist. Yeah. Never been done before. Before I was a gold medalist. Before he was a gold medalist. I don't, I, I don't know how to pick them. No. Anyway, uh, great chatting to you Mark and uh, I know Tom and Julie and the Fozzie will enjoy this and um, and we'll afford having a chat uh, now about your event and uh, how we can help build that too. Yeah, love it. Thanks, See guys. You guys. See you. Bye. Right. Yeah, nice. Fantastic. Yes. Huh? Really nice. I don't know the gentleman. I've not. I've not met him, but uh, I look forward, hopefully, to meeting him sometime. I, as Gordon Smith says, it has become a very popular league in Denmark in, in a lot of countries, and yeah. it is club racing. It's not unlike what New York Yacht Club is doing, except I don't think it's strictly Corinthian. I think anybody can sail on their club's team, but it is a club team. Mm -hmm. And it's a, as he said, it's not foiling. It's in, you know, some kind of displacement boat that everybody is used to sailing mm -hmm. and and uh, happy to watch sailing in and around their own club. So bravo Zulu to them. And thanks, Alistair, for another report. It's two in a week, three in, in three shows in a row. So he's been very. Now, I just wanted to give you a little more about Mark. And I actually know the gentleman on the left quite well, Tom King, who I've done some regattas with, sailing judging. And this is the 2000 Olympic gold medalist in the 470 class, Tom King there on the left, and Mark Turnbull, before he'd shaved his head, there on the right. Well, it's 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about Victor Kovalenko, who, who was, the, uh, Alistair, I guess, gave him the nickname of the medal maker. He was the Russian coach the Aussies wisely hired and has been coaching. I think he's now retired or semi-retired. Yeah, but, I remember uh, the story. Yeah. Great stuff. And these, it's, you know, if maybe the UK's got the best record of late and Australia's certainly right up there. Tom King, in the meantime, I, I Googled him when I was preparing a couple of these slides because I hadn't talked, hadn't caught up with Tom in a while. That is, see, there he is in 2000. Here he is this year or maybe last year, late last year. It looked the same. <laughs> He is the chief investment officer at a, a sustainability-focused Nanook asset management, said the election result, they've just had the, uh, an election, what, a year ago now, would remove policy uncertainty and enable the wealth sector, sector in Australia, business and industry, to act with confidence to begin the decarbonization process. And that apparently is Tom's and his company's focus is on sustainability, stock picking, at which he's apparently, according to a couple of magazines, 
articles, websites that I saw about Tom is doing very well indeed. We can only hope. Great. Thank you, Alistair. Alistair's awesome Aussie anecdote for today. Keep them coming. Great stuff. Uh, just our last leg now, a couple of videos. I've, I've, you, a lot of you have said that you like these videos that we're playing in the last leg at the end of the show. It's easy to digest, nice stuff. The first I, I like because I may start calling this the volunteer of the day. And we have a segment, Julia, called volunteer of the day. Good idea. Because, uh, again, as we all say, and we, we say any number of times that without the volunteers, our sport could not, would not run. And this first video is from the Rolex Big Boat Series. Now, that's the winner of the series. The sleek Santa Cruz 50, Octavia, this is from St. Francis Yacht Club's uh, press release on the final day, took a commanding lead from day one and carried it all the way through to the end, resulting in owner and skipper Shep Cat winning the St. Francis Perpetual Trophy in a Rolex timepiece, yada, yada. So... Uh, congratulations to the others as well. But the point of this is that to say that this regatta, which is a big deal, we don't often report on it because it's a, it's a local regatta. But it didn't used to be. But it didn't used to be. It used to attract boats from up and down the West Coast. And around from, the world. It was on the on the, the around the world circuit. Well, and from Hawaii and from New Zealand and Australia. Not so much from Europe, but some. Well, don't, don't give me your <laughs> dismissive. Yes. Okay, but it's become sort of the J-Fest of late. But nonetheless, it's yes. still a big regatta with a lot of volunteers. And we have a video about one, of, and I don't think very many people have seen it, but to Rolex produced video about one of your favorite past Commodores, staff Commodores as they call them here, mm -hmm. Jim Kiriakis. Oh, good. Called the Dawn Patrol. And I had no idea the amount of time, and he's been doing this for, I don't know, I 20 know. years. I know, with, with Gomes. With and your show. friend, John, our friend, our mutual yeah. friend, John Gomes, Beach Street Yacht Club member. But have a look at this cool video. You get here very early in the morning, you feel prepared, it's dark. The sun comes up. Usually it's less windy in the morning. The water's smooth. You can see wildlife, birds. We're out in nature, beginning to set the course for the day. You can see the wind conditions begin to develop and get a feel for the current on the marks. We've been doing this tradition for 25 years, partially because it's fun, partially because we love it, and we also think it allows us to get more organized and better prepared for the regatta. The effort of the years we put in demonstrate the love and the commitment and the persistence we have over time for the tradition. Nice. Yes, very. Video. Jim yeah. Kiriakis, staff commodore Jim Kiriakis, a good friend of both Julie's and mine. And it's people like Jim and others. And he's really super smart, super nice, easy. He is all those things and was a great commodore. And yes, he was, and hardworking. Volunteer of the day, staff commodore Jim Kiriakis and uh, the thousands of people like him who make our sport. There are 400, 450 volunteers who Oops, work. Oops, I'm going to start that again. Say, go There ahead. are 450 volunteers who work on Big Boat. On Big Boat? Yeah, it's it's like what's going on in Bermuda with the Gold Cup. It's like what goes on at Congressional Cup and Governor's Cup down at Balboa Yacht Club. Yeah. So, okay, and then this final video I started there at, uh, prematurely. But this is from France and La Voile de Saint-Tropez, day seven yesterday. Fabulous video.
My grandfather brought the boat over from the States to Europe um, in the early 80s and uh, came here for fun, for cruising. Um, found himself always in a good company of people and um, social and having a good time and, and loved racing and um, made the challenge to, to Ikra, to Jean Lorraine, and they they ended up going out that day. Um, so they, they had a big one-on-one -on -one match race, and from there on it grew every year um, into something uh, better and better. The boat was sold to um, uh, two Italians. They were passionate not just for um, you know, the amazing SNS1 boat model, but also for the story um, that she, she had. And in 2021, we were here and um, noted, I think while having lunch at Sank on Sank, that the boat was for sale. And then last summer, uh, my husband Will, um, who's uh, a really amazing, talented sailor, um, and I had our 10-year wedding anniversary. We went to Venice um, to celebrate, and the boat was only about an hour or so from Venice, so uh, we went to visit. He took us out sailing. We had meals together and, uh, and started the negotiation. Then, so. After some back and forth, we purchased the boat. The hull was great. It's an amazing boat, but it, it did need a lot of work to be safe and modernized in uh, some ways. So um, new electronics, we got new sails, and uh, we had rig um, put on, and we did all of that in Italy um, in very short order. And everyone keeps asking, yeah? So it's, um, it's been a, a long, uh, you know, 40 plus years of competition, right? Um, in good fun. Ikra is a 12 meter. She's obviously a bigger, faster boat than us, so, but there's chance. So we're trying. We'll hopefully have a good race and hopefully, really, more than anything, we have some breeze, right? What a regatta. Yes. What a, blo a beloved, bloody, cool sport, huh? Yes. Fabulous sport. Laval de Saint-Tropez, as you all know. And it goes a couple more days. It wraps up Sunday, the 8th of October. And we appreciate that video that came from our longtime friend, Gilles Martin Raget, oh. who along with, uh, there's six of them, well, there's three of them, both whose names are Gilles and GG, and they're, uh, this, they call themselves 6G, and they're doing video production for Lavoie. Uh, that looks like a great event, Gord Smith is saying. Ah, boats, Clark Chapin, where you can see more of the crew than the tops of their helmets. Oh, yes. Wow, sailors actually sailing the boats, no computer flight controls or digital sail controls, and long time history and tradition. I mean, look yes. at it. They go back and buy the boat back from the Italians so they can have this challenge again against. Yeah. Yeah. Pride and Icarus, is just cool stuff, as some of you will know better than I. I have been to the regatta, but only briefly stopped through one time. Fabulous, fabulous stuff at Lavoie. Okay, Julio, uh, yes. you know what time it is when we hear that music. Yes. It's Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. <laughs> we hear the jets flying around now. Yeah. Hopefully our audio has been okay today with our somewhat uh, different normal studio configuration. It amazes me how much exercise and extra fries <laughs> <laughs> sound alike. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't know about you. I eat reasonably healthy. Yeah. I try to, you know, yeah. I uh, you do. don't eat 
too much of, I eat no sugar, virtually. But the one thing I really have a soft spot in my heart for. French fries. French fries. Right. Okay, so you try to eat sweet potato fries. Are they better for you? Are sweet potato fries better for you than French fries? Uh, they, uh, they have more um, real food in them, I guess. Uh, but, but I, don't I don't know, Julia. But it, uh, I'm sure that it doesn't make that much difference. <laughs> Emmett is saying, plenty of space for all aspects of sailing in our beloved sport. There's plenty of space in my stomach for sweet potato fry. Mm -hmm. John Van Buren is saying, second time in 25 plus years, only the second time that he's missing Saint-Tropez. No better way to wrap uh, up the Northern Hemisphere season. No. Ed Worley likes in and out fries. Yeah, they're okay. Probably, probably worse. More sugar. No, no sugar. It amazes me how much exercise and extra fries I don't like. <laughs> I'll have some exercise. Oh, I mean extra fries. <laughs> Finally, this from Ed Worley. And uh, I, he says he Googled my, this is a meme, obviously, but I Googled my symptoms. Turns out I just need to go sailing. And for extra credit, Palm <laughs> Free, yep, James Frederick Bland, J. Frederick Bland. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out I just need to go sailing. But what kind of a boat, Ed Worley? Is this? Does any can any of the Fozzy identify this double ender with a mid boom sheeting, a Vang? I mean, it's a pretty modern rig, I guess. I don't know what it is. I honestly don't know. Somebody must know. Ted Ryman likes chips, meaning fries. Mm -hmm. Sweet potatoes are much better for you. White potatoes are more carb loaded. Julia, and now we're back on. Okay, I've started a whole thread on carbs. What kind of boat is that, Julia? A sailing canoe. It does look like a sailing canoe, Joe, but there's no a duck punt, Graham Sweeney says. Ed Worley questions. I think it's a sailboat, <laughs> Rick Banner. Rick, <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Rick had a, he said that I was the first person that ever used the words, the words Dennis Connor and Skinny in the same sentence when I was talking about Skinny, meaning <laughs> right, the lowdown. Right, right. And Dennis, you know, back in the day was pretty trim. He was, yes, he was. I think it's a sailboat. <laughs> it it clearly though is a double ender. I mean, the boat comes to a point back here in the back and a point up up here in the front. Nobody can tell a British moth, mm, a I dunk, a duck punt. Graham Sweeney. Graham's pretty knowledgeable. Yep. Well, we'll that'll be our homework assignment for the next show, which of course is on Tuesday. And we'll see if anybody can come up authoritatively with what that boat is. Maybe Graham's got it. Maybe duck punt is the right word. It gets us to the finish line in our back to Bermuda where we started with this J24 finishing there. Julie, your witness. Yes. Like, follow, and share this beautiful sport. Thank you. And this show, which, uh, and by the way, if you, if you want to really help us, go on to the YouTube channel, Sailing Illustrated's YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And like or, or subscribe to that channel. We're nearly up to 1,000 subscribers, and good things happen if we get to 1,000 subscribers. Oh, good. So all of you can go there. Sailing canoes don't reside under world sailing. That's so great. <laughs> At Clark Chapin making a joke about Mariner. At least it's tapered at both ends. <laughs> fun, fun, fun as always. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick Banner. SI, always a great way to start the weekend. Ed Worley is saying, yeah, thanks to everybody. Uh, comments are welcome, as I said, even in replay. Do, and we got a new, we got a new pat patron this week. Yes. Every little bit helps. Patreon at patreon.com slash join slash Sailing Illustrated if you want to give us a buck or two or five or ten or more per month to help pay the bills here and keep us on the air. Thank you to all who gave us materiel, audio, visual, for today's show. Julia, final thoughts? I, I was just thinking that uh, Patreon makes giving very easily because uh, I, I just, every month, I just take it out. And I, it just goes. Comes it just right. goes. Yeah. yeah, some people f find that a little disconcerting to have. Give us somebody your credit card and just, you know, you can forget about it. But in uh, any event, it's still the cleanest, safest way to do it. There's a few other things like buy me a coffee. You know, there's a thing called buy me a coffee. You can put in three bucks and mm -hmm. a lot of people do that as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have next week guests, both Tuesday and Friday, interesting guests. This is the uh, at times controversial, but super coach Fernando Happy Alegre from Peru, who's an optimist dinghy coach and team leader extraordinaire. 
who's come under fire uh, of late, he's going to come on and explain his side of the story that happened at an event earlier this year. Delighted to have Happy, as he's known, on the show live as our guest next Tuesday. And then on Friday, one of the smartest people, you know, we know Stan Honey and a few others who are really smart and our Fozy who are damn smart. Mm -hmm. But we have Robbie King, who sailed the Governor's Cup in 2022, a Brit who's here, Julia, in California. He's, he's here, I think, at UC at Berkeley. Or no, he's at, um, he's at Cal, uh, the Rocket Science College down south. Caltech. Caltech, thank you. I think he's at Caltech. But one or the other, getting a PhD in quantum computing mm -hmm. and AI, artificial intelligence. And Robbie is going to be on... And he is going to try to explain to us in simple terms what really is, because this is cutting edge stuff. It's yeah. going to affect all of us, whether it's in our sport or otherwise. He's going to explain quantum computing and its impact on artificial intelligence and where is the world and our beloved sport heading. He... Uh, <laughs> Hope he wasn't talking to the handsy Spanish coach. No, James. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. No, but uh, this is something that I, I follow Robbie. I already try to anyway on his uh, Twitter, his ex, formerly Twitter. And he posted a few days ago an example sheet question from first year of uni, which I still don't know how to solve. For which integers N is there only one group of order N? And for extra credit, along with the name of that, that boat we were just looking at, that's your homework assignment over the weekend mm -hmm. for, uh, if not Tuesday show next Friday, when Robbie will be our guest. Hope you have a great rest of your week and weekend, wherever in the world you are, and that you'll join us on Tuesday. In the meantime, sail fast, sail safe, and have fun. Ciao for now. <laughs>